I need to go in prayer and uh, confess my sin. I am covetous over that voice. <laughs> I think I was tempted as covetous, but I don't think I sinned because I'm not going to attack him and try to take his voice away from him. That's, I wouldn't do that anyway. Did you see the biceps on that guy? Huh? <laughs> Whoa. Anyway, wow, what a beautiful, I've never heard that song, and forgive me for not hearing that. That was just an incredible, incredible song. The way it was sung, but the words of that song, just absolutely incredible. I'm blessed by that. You talk, if, if I can't preach now, <laughs> I can't preach, that's all there is to it, after listening to that. Wow. It was a, it was a joy to spend an hour with our missionary from 6 o'clock and listen to um, Brother Vance talk about Kenya. And uh, we're going to be doing something like that again tomorrow night. Yes. So we, we want to, who will be doing that tomorrow night? Mario. Okay, Mario's going to be. I want to invite you folks to come out. You're missing a real blessing. Now, I know it's a tough time. It's 6 o'clock, you got to eat dinner sometime and all that. Kids are coming home from school or whatnot. But if, if you can make the 6 o'clock time, just to sit and listen to the missionaries and listen to their hearts, it will be well worth it. But I wanted to say this for that, but for another reason. I listened to him pretty carefully. Because, because I've done a lot of counseling and listening to people, you want to give people good counseling, you have to listen to what they're saying, and you have to minimize your talking. Um, I really listened carefully to what he, what he said. And over and over, although he didn't use this term frequently, he did use the word, but he certainly used the concept. And that is this, desire. Desire. We've come to a missions conference, and if anything is going to change for you individually, and that's the way it's going to happen. Corporately, yes, a church can grow and change. We know that. But it's only when the people, the individual people in the church grow and change and become better, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But there has to be desire. You've got to want to do it. Years ago, I used to do long-distance running. And when I'd talk to somebody about it, they'd say, boy, well, the journey of a marathon begins with the first step. And that's not true. The journey of a, mar a marathon begins right here in your head. You have to say, I want to do that. You've got to have to, you have to have the desire before you take any kind of steps to compete at any level in any sport. It's got to be first in your mind. Now, I say that because we're here for a purpose, stated very clearly, and your pastor read this last night, and I mentioned it yesterday on both services in the morning, and if you haven't taken the time particularly to read his message on the inside, you need to do that to get on the same page with where he is and understand his desire for you as a church. This is vitally important because we come to church and we got lots of different motives for being here, but we all need to have primarily the motives of exalting Jesus Christ, getting more involved in missions, supporting and encouraging our present missionaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are important. But your pastor spelled it out pretty clearly right here in this piece of literature. So I want to encourage you to take the time to read it. I did, and uh, it helped me. It certainly did. Well, my, if you just stumbled in here tonight, I didn't get an introduction. I can tell I'm, you know, I'm not that important anymore. But my name is George Grace, and um, um, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And uh, I've been asked to deliver some sermons um, to kind of pull the ideas of what we're here for. So if you go back to the piece of literature that he wrote, he asked me to come here to try to promote 
what he wrote in there. So that's why I'm here. Now, maybe, maybe you just kind of stumbled in here. This is First Bible Baptist Church. That's where you are right now. And if you're on the wrong flight, you need to get off right now, all right? You can go out and get some coffee for the rest of the evening. That'll be fine. But anyway, uh, I'm kidding, of course. You know, I need no introduction. Uh, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> in fact, I'm glad when I don't get an introduction. I really am because I have no idea what's going to be said about me. And usually half of it's not or more is not true, the bad stuff particularly. Anyway, we're, we are in a missions conference, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a primary missions text in the Word of God. We know that in every book of the first five books of the New Testament, we are told in one way or another to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so our missionaries that are with us here uh, have surrendered to that call at some point in their life. But they will be the first to tell you that before you ever go someplace else to be a missionary, you need to be a missionary right where you are. In fact, you may end up just being a missionary right here in the Kansas City area the rest of your life. That is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's up. God places people where he wants them. That isn't up to me. It isn't up to your pastor. It's really up to God. And listening to God's call on your life just as uh, missionary Vance shared with us how he got to go to, to Kenya, you know, everybody has a different story. I was listening to Pastor Matovich last night. He's working with some men in his church, and that question came up. How did you get where you are? In fact, that was asked me probably two weeks ago. And everybody's story is different, but there are certain things that we have in common. Number one, there has to be a desire. You've got to want to be used of God. We don't want you to come to a missions conference and then walk out Wednesday night after it's all over the same way you walked in yesterday morning. We are hoping that you'll be stirred, that you'll be motivated, that God will work in your life and you will be obedient. That's another thing. You'll listen to what he has to say. You'll respond positively with desire, and then the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And everybody doesn't get the same recipe. Everybody doesn't get the same directions. God will work in your life once you say, Lord, here am I, send me. Here am I. When I left my job at Eastman Kodak Company 55 years ago, I just said, Lord, I want to do something in the ministry. I, don't, I had no Bible training, no Bible education behind me, but I had a desire to be involved in what God was doing in our community through our local church. I literally, and Mike can tell you this, Pastor Manovich, because we worked together those first few years, I started below the bottom rung of the ladder. But I did have something that was worth a lot, and that was I wanted to be used. I wanted to get involved. And that thrust me forward to the next step. When God put something in my path and said, I want you to do this, and I can't tell you how you can be discerning. You just need to listen to him. He'll talk to you personally through your prayer life and the circumstances of life and the people in your life that come into him. You'll see what he wants you to do. But I'm going to ask you before I say anything tonight, do you really desire to be better than you are right now? Nobody's perfect in here. Everybody has room to grow. Everybody has room to be better than they are. Everybody, everybody in here. You want to be? Do you want to be? What will motivate us? Right there in Christ alone. That's what will motivate us. We couldn't be talking about anything more important than Jesus Christ. This book is all about him from beginning to end. I, I, you'll never run out of material preaching on Jesus. 
You can start in the book of Genesis and just start reading through it and stop in all the pictures and all the types and all the prophecies, and it'll take you a lifetime to get through the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. You, I promise you, you'll never get done preaching about Jesus Christ. If that's the only theme or topic that you ever, that you ever pursued. So it's easy for me really to do this. However, some of you will be disappointed because I didn't quote your famous verse or your favorite verse about Jesus, you know? And so, you know, he talked about Jesus, but he didn't quote X, you know, Y, Z scripture from the book of Hab Habakkuk, chapter three, verse 13, or whatever it is. And you'll be disappointed and upset. We can't hit everything here, but we can hit some things that are important. So what I did yesterday is I started with a question from Song of Solomon. Now, listen to me. Hang on. I have preached before. This is going to be hard to believe. I have preached before when people disagreed with me. Isn't it? Now, honestly, I've preached at least 8,000 times and probably 10,000 times. Do you think anybody ever disagreed with what I said? Do you think anybody? Any, my wife disagrees with what I say sometimes, you know? She's my greatest critic. You know, George, you said this, but that was the wrong verse. This is our... Ooh, you, so, my point is, my point is simply this. My interpretation of the text from Song of Solomon is how I read that. You might think that I was too sensual or I was too puritanical or whatever it was. Great! Save it and don't tell me. I don't care what you think, all right? I just... Now, if someone would have said something to me, I wouldn't have said that because I'm sensitive enough not to embarrass you. But it's a good way to make sure no one does say anything about it. All right. Okay. We can move on. We had our meeting, and now we're going to get into the message tonight, all right? The purpose, the purpose for Song of Solomon, we, we laid that out yesterday. But... I focused in on a question in Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 9, and I can't rehearse it all over again, but these young ladies, these daughters of Jerusalem, question the Shulamite and say, what's so good about your husband? That's the question. There's a type there. There's Christ in the church. There's God in Israel, etc. And I lay that out. We're talking about the husband typifying Jesus Christ, and we're talking about the wife being typified by the Shulamite woman. So the Shulamite says, what's so cool or what's so great about, or excuse me, the daughters of Jerusalem say, what's so cool or what's so great about your husband? And so that's the question, and that's what I'm trying to answer here. What's so great about Jesus Christ? So that's where we started. We got into the book of Hebrews. We kind of introduced the book of Hebrews. And the reason for Hebrews is because, and again, a controversial book in the Bible, like Song of Solomon, a controversial book. But the reason for the writing of the book of Hebrews was to convince Jews who were on the bubble, so to speak, that Jesus Christ truly was their Messiah. That's what that book's all about. So what the author, and I believe it was Paul, and I told you yesterday why I don't think his name is on there, but what Paul is writing, and he's laying out how Jesus is better than the Old Testament example of this, the Old Testament example of that, this Old Testament entity, this Old Testament person, this Old Testament office. And so the writer systematically goes through everything the Jews held in high esteem. They were typical things. They were allegories, so to speak, representing the real thing, and the real thing has come, and his name is Jesus. Jesus has come. So the author is trying to convince Jews who are on the bubble and also reinforce in the minds of believers that Jesus is who he claimed to be. So that's what we see in the book of Hebrews. By the way, the notes, all of these overheads, and there'll be a lot of them here tonight again, all of these overheads are on the internet, are they not? They will be on the internet, on YouTube, next to the video, near the videos of these services. So if you want to get them, I'm trying to save you time from sitting there and writing, you know, a, a term paper while I'm preaching, so you don't have to do that. 
All right. There's several things that are attacked today, major things theologically in Christianity that are attacked. Number one, the whole idea of truth. We live in an environment today that believes in relative truth. You have your truth, I have my truth, and your truth and my truth are equal. You believe in your religion, I believe in my religion, and they're all equal. They all lead to the same place to God. Now, you know that's not true, but you hear that often out there in the world today. So truth is being touted as being relative. It can be subjective and still valid. You can have your truth, I can have my truth, and they're all true. Now, that's not a definition of truth but we're all being hornswoggled into believing that that's true. So that's one thing. The second thing is evolution. Evolution is the substitute for creationism. Now, technically, atheists generally will not say evolution is responsible for creation, but they kind of back into it from, from from here, they'll back up into evolution, and then you get to the place where you say, well, where did things begin? Well, we've been talking about evolution and the Big Bang and all this stuff, and, and so you're supposed to believe that they're answering your question about creation rather than talking about God as the creator. The Bible states, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's what it says. I believe that to be true. I believe that to be the truth, not my truth or somebody else's truth, but it's the truth. So that is being attacked. Thirdly, the Bible is being attacked. And it is incredible. It's a bunch of fairy tales and stories made up, written by men that make mistakes. There's all kinds of errors in the Bible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's being attacked. The fourth thing that's being attacked is the doctrine of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ isn't God manifest in the He was a good prophet, he was a good man, probably misunderstood, but he died. And you don't believe in the resurrection, do you? You don't believe that he's coming again. You don't believe that stuff in the book of Revelation about judgment and all. You don't believe that, do you? That is being attacked. So those are the four major things that are being attacked in Christianity today. By the way, we're dealing with all of them in your apologetics class in your Bible Institute. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. You have to have a lot of faith to be an atheist, more than you need to be a Christian, believe me. So anyway we're going to talk about tonight the deity of Christ, but we're going to sneak up on it through the book of uh, Hebrews, all right? So let's get into it now. We're talking about Hebrews. We talked about the Song of Solomon. This is the verse that we used to kick off our sermon yesterday morning. Now we're talking about the book of Hebrews. Here's, here's our introductory statement. The primary purpose of the book of Hebrews is to show the immeasurable superiority of Jesus Christ. We can stop right there. That's what this is all about. That's what my sermons are all about. He is number one, and he is worthy to be lovesick over. The book is directed to Hebrews to persuade them of Christ's superiority. We've said that. The book is written to the nation of Israel, saved and lost. They're on the bubble, and the writer is trying to get them over the hump to believe. That's what that book is all about. In every way, Christ, according to Hebrews, supersedes everything under the old covenant. And that's what we see here in these early outlines of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is the focal point of the book. We went through this yesterday morning. I'm doing a quick review here. We went through these particular uh, points yesterday morning, about nine of them, if I'm not mistaken. And then that book uh, leads us into an outline of the whole book. So you can see, particularly in the first eight chapters of the book, how this, this is important. Number one, we're going to see Christ's superiority over the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, etc., etc., all those minor prophets. We see Christ's superiority over the angels, highly respected 
Angels made appearances. There was the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, but there were angels that made appearances in other places. Very, very rare appearances. But when they showed up, they brought a very special message. So they were held in very high esteem. Well, Jesus is superior to them. Christ is superior over Moses. He is the individual that led the children of Israel out of bondage, out of Egypt, and it was to him on Mount Sinai that he was given the Ten Commandments. It's kind of an important document, is it not? I mean, we still talk about the Ten Commandments. If I'm not mistaken, it's on the wall of the Supreme Court above where the judges sit down. I don't know if any of them turn around and read it, but still... <laughs> It's the Ten Commandments are still revered as, as a very reputable document in our society. Not by everybody, but still probably by the majority. And then the superiority of Christ over Aaron. Now you say, well, why Aaron? Because Aaron became the high priest. Moses wasn't the high priest. Remember, Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. Aaron, his brother, became the high priest. The high priest was the number one religious figure among the Jews. He was their representative. A priest it represents the people to God, whereas a prophet represents God to the people. Aaron wasn't a prophet. Aaron was a priest. So he went to God with the issues of the people of Israel, and it was his responsibility to plead their case and their cause. He was the number one religious figure, and the Bible says that he, Christ, was even superior over him. So, there's other things here that are important. I'll just show them to you. The second major portion of the book talks about Calvary, where Christ was crucified, and how it represents the new and a better covenant than the old covenant under, the, under Moses, the Mosaic covenant. And then the third major section talks about the importance of faith, faith. Now, I said before, I probably have been wrong many times when I've preached about something that I've said. There are things that I have believed in the past that I changed my mind about. I really did. I know that's hard for you to believe, but I have. I've changed my mind about them. For 25 years, I believed that you could be saved by your works. I grew up as a Roman Catholic, and I believed that you could be saved by the grace of God. I mean, everybody gets the grace of God, right? But my works were the primary reason for my salvation. I believed that until I was 25 years old. When I was 25 years old, that's when someone witnessed to me and they began to share the scriptures and it was at that point that I changed my mind theologically about what I believed about how a person is saved. And I, believe, I changed my mind based on two major verses. One was this, the fellow that led me to the Lord said, do you know for sure if you died right now you'd go to heaven? And I said, no, no one can know that. He opened his New Testament to 1 John 5.10, and it says, These things have been written unto you that believe upon the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I read that, and I said, Whoops, I pooped here, didn't I? This didn't turn out very good. And I, I was faced with my stupidity right there in the Bible. I didn't say anything. I couldn't respond to that because it was as plain as day that that text said you could know you have eternal life. So that got my attention. Well, here's another one. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. It's not of your works, the Bible says. Your works do not save you. Your works are a display or the fruit of your salvation experience, a fruit of your faith. That's what the book of James is all about, that your you know, faith without works is dead. Your works shows that you have genuine faith. You're not saved by your works, but your works are an emblem or a proof that you are truly saved. So those were the two major verses. It's the word of God, Pastor Mark. It was the word of God. Now, this guy was the messenger. 
it wasn't because he was good looking, he was older than me, he was smarter than me. He was, there wasn't anything about him that made me listen to what he had to say or agree with what I saw in the Bible. It was the scriptures that got my attention. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now again, if you're stumbled in here tonight and you've never heard anything like this, I hope you're listening really carefully. You can't save yourself. No one is perfect. I said that before. No one in here can save himself or herself. Only Jesus Christ can save you. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He has purged your sins. That's a statement right out of the book of Hebrews. Well, anyway, we looked at this yesterday, and I, we didn't look at this in... Um, uh, we didn't look at this in the second service, but we did in the first service yesterday, so I'm going to repeat it. This is going back to the beginning of those four things in Hebrews, Christ's superiority over the Old Testament prophets. That's the first thing that is brought up in the book of Hebrews. And there are several things said about Jesus. Jesus is appointed heir of all things. That's why he's so great. Jesus made the world. That's pretty good. You know, none of you made the worlds here. None of us did. We didn't even do it collectively. But he made the worlds. He's the brightness of his, God's glory. Jesus is the express image of his person, the express image of God himself. Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. That is, he maintains and he sustains. And then Jesus by himself, I mentioned that a moment ago, purged our sins. He made the atonement. He alone is our Savior. And lastly, in verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 1, it says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. A very specific position, seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, if you've stumbled with the Trinity, join the crowd. That's a difficult that's a difficult um, doctrine in the New Testament. There's a lot of people that uh, stumble over that. Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that Jesus is divinity. There's a lot of Pentecostal, Jesus-only Pentecostals. There are uh, the Mormons. There are a lot of groups that do not accept the Trinity or they do not accept the divinity of Christ <clears throat> for the same reasons, obviously. But why is he so good? He's superior over all of the Old Testament prophets, and they were highly revered. Christ is also superior over the angels, and as I said, the angels were highly revered, and they were respected in the, in the Old Testament. How is he, he superior over the angels? In his name, chapter uh, 1, verses 4 and 5. In his worship, he's worshiped. In his nature, who he is, 7 through 9 in chapter 1, his personal existence, and his ultimate destiny. All of these things are spelled out very clearly in the very first chapter of the book of Hebrews. You think Paul was trying to get their attention? You know who Jesus was? You know who this person was that we're talking about right now? The one that we believe rose from the dead? In fact, there's over 500 people, according, <clears throat> according to Paul, 500 people that actually witnessed, saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, that was written within the life spans of those people that supposedly witnessed it. No one ever stepped forward and said, now, Paul's lying, 500 people. I think he's counting me, but I wasn't one of them. No one ever said anything negative about that. And there were people, 500 people or more, that had actually witnessed the resurrected Christ. So, he's superior over the angels. He is uh, superior also over Moses, chapter 3, chapter number 4. He's superior over Moses for several reasons that I've written down. I didn't put them on the slide here, but listen to me. Moses was an apostle. Jesus is called the Apostle, capital A. Moses was a member of an house. Christ is the builder of the house. 
Moses was connected with a single house, Christ is the creator of all houses. Moses was a man, Christ is God. Moses was but a servant, Christ is the son. Moses was a testimony of things to be spoken of after Christ supplied the substance and fulfillment of that which Moses prophesied. Moses was but a servant in the house of Jehovah. Christ was the son over his own. Now, I know you didn't get that. I just said a lot of stuff. And I want you to know there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about Jesus. So you can sit there and go, man, that you, you just went by too fast, Pastor Grace. I mean, I, I expect to... I, do, I don't care if you got the seven things I just said. What I care is that you understand you're supposed to be lovesick. I'm supposed to be lovesick over this individual. This is the individual. This is the focal point. This is the, the, the head of our faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ. Let me tell you why you'll go to the mission field. And I heard it from our brother tonight. The Lord, the Lord sent him. He got a message. Now, I don't know how he got his message. Everybody gets that. Do I think that God, Jesus, came down and appeared to him on his bedstead at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, you need to go to Zambia or Kenya or whatnot? No, I don't believe that. But I do believe that God works through people. He works through pastors. He works through churches. He works through the circumstances of life. And he works through a still small voice in you saying, this is what you should do. And we are to respond to what he says. I walked out of East Mount Kodak Company, and there's many other people like me. I listened to the brother's testimony. I think he said he was an IT man and his wife was a nurse. They walked away from their professions to go to, to Kenya. What are they, nuts? What are they, crazy? Why would you do something like that? I walked away from my job in the research laboratories of Eastman Kodak Company when I was 26 years old. I had, uh, this is the truth. Let me tell you the truth. I had a man look at me and say, George, don't do it. And he wept. I told him I was leaving Kodak to go into the ministry. And he said, don't do it. You can't leave Mother Kodak. You can't leave you this, you're, this living and these bonuses and all of these benefits of this great company that it used to be. It ain't anymore. I'm glad I trusted the Lord in 1973 and I didn't trust Kodak. He literally cried right in front of me, shed tears because I was leaving my job. Why did I do that? I believed it was the right thing to do. He said, man, I wish I had the faith. All you have to do is believe what God says to you. What is he doing with you in your life? If you've already ruled it out and said, man, I'll, I'll do anything God wants me to do, except, 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 except. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Bobby Bonner had some exceptions before he finally said, I'm going to go to Africa. Am I not correct? I've heard Bobby's testimony many times. He said, no, no, <laughs> no, <sighs> okay. <laughs> and he finally, and Bobby Bonner, and I said this yesterday, and there's a lot of good people in here that I love, but he's the only person in this room that I have ever said, you are my hero. You are my hero. And there's some great people. I love your pastor, Pastor Matovich, and others in here that I've met over the years. But I know what he went through and what he gave. And I watched him. I was his pastor when he went through this struggle and surrendered to God and went to Africa. And I saw how God used him and Mark Brown and Mike Matovich, and you, and you, and you. But there's got to be a desire. You've got to say, here am I, Lord. Okay, there goes my job. Not getting a Corvette. Not going to have a, not going to have a cottage on Sanibel Island. That's a good move, by the way. <laughs> I'm giving up a lot of stuff. I didn't give up a thing, my friend. I didn't give up a thing. 
I don't have one regret about that decision. I believe that by God's grace that I did the right thing. I'm not a hero for doing it. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Isn't that a simple statement? That's Romans chapter 4. That's New Testament. Abraham believed God. Do you? Do you? It's not that complicated. Do you have a desire? Are you lovesick? We're talking about the creator of the universe. Me, you know, I know three or four of them. Do you really? You know three or four creators of the universe? There is, he's incomparable. That means you can't compare anyone to him. But Paul's trying to, to show the Jews, you need to trust him as your savior. Now I'm getting, I'm not sure I'm preaching my message anymore, but anyway, Christ's superiority over Aaron. Okay, I know where I want to go. And I, wanna, I want you to get out on time tonight so you'll come back tomorrow night. I don't ever want to be the reason why you wouldn't be here tomorrow night in church. And I hope my personality is not offensive to you. My voice may be offensive to you. I don't have a voice of the, that guy that sang before. I don't have a voice like, I got a, <laughs> not, never mind, I won't say it. I don't have a voice like that. But I hope the words that I'm saying from the Bible are not offensive to you. I hope you're listening. I hope it's creating a desire in your heart. The deity, Jesus Christ is God. I said there's four things that are being challenged today. What is truth? Who created the heaven and earth? Is the Bible truly the word of God? And is Jesus Christ God manifest in the flesh. Those are the biggies. Those are the biggies. And if you're in your apologetics class, we are dealing with all four of them on a weekly basis over the internet. All right. Let's talk about Jesus' deity. We have about seven or eight minutes to do this. Watch. We can do it quickly. Again, we're reminded, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? O oh, thou fairest among women, what is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou didst so charge us? Go out into the community. Find my husband. Tell him I'm lovesick. I want my husband. I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick for Jesus, the deity of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 3 says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. And the word was made flesh, John chapter 1, and dwelt among us. That's John chapter 1, verse 14. The deity of Jesus Christ. The deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is a fundamental Bible doctrine that is consistently attacked consistently because if you can destroy the reputation or personage or characterization of Christ you can get you can bring christianity down it can tumble so what's so great about him well he's referred to as lord well, that's pretty good none of you are the virgin birth boy is that unusual I was talking about Adam and Eve yesterday, that Adam was Eve's mother. <laughs> what about this? Jesus didn't have a human father, but he did have a human mother. But she was conceived of the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 1 tells us. The only individual ever conceived, both God and both man. Well, why didn't he just come as God? Because he came as the God-man. So you and I would know, at least believe, that he could identify with our humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ was given divine names in prophecy. I love Isaiah chapter 9 when it says he's wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Who is that referring to? It's a prophecy of the coming of Christ. Titles for God. In Exodus chapter 3... Moses says to God, the burning bush incident, he says, 
who should I tell them, the Israelites, that sent me? And God says, tell them, I am. You say, what's that mean? I am means he's the self-existent one. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He is not subject to time, space, or matter. He is the originator of all energy. The life that you have in you today came from God. Not directly, but it came through all the generations of your predecessors, your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. I'll stop there. Came through all of them. Your life. I'm walking around with God's life in me. And when he wants to take it, it's up to him. Don't we believe that? I am. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He's the I am. So you got a Jehovah Witness friend, they will challenge the divinity of Christ. You get a hold of these slides and put them somewhere. When someone challenges it, you're going to have about 60 or 70 scripture verses to prove that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. If one of those people shows up at your door and you're not prepared, you just look like an idiot. Because they're going to tell you about the kingdom and how you can get in the kingdom and all that. And you're going to be going, ah, bah, ah, bah, ah, bah, ah, bah, ah, bah. No, ah, bah, ah, bah. my pastor said that Jesus is God. And then they're going to give you two or three verses in the Bible that suggest he isn't. And you're going to go, gee, I didn't know those were verses in the Bible. I don't think there's any other verses in the Bible that prove Jesus is God. Don't be an idiot. Yeah. Well, excuse me, that's not a good word to use. I shouldn't use that. How about moron? <laughs> Do you feel better? <laughs> Anytime I use the word idiot, and my, my wife isn't here, but she doesn't like that word at all. So I wouldn't have used it if she was here, but I know you like it. So anyway, <laughs> Jesus had creative powers. He's the creator. That's John chapter 1. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning God created. John chapter 1 tells us it's Jesus Christ, that God created by Jesus Christ. We saw it also in Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus received worthy worship, excuse me, worship due to God. He received worship. The Bible is clear when it says that you worship only God. Well, people will worship Jesus and he never said, don't do that. You've made a big mistake. You don't worship me. He accepted that worship. In fact, in John chapter 20, when Thomas was confronted by the resurrected Christ, he looked at him and he said, my God, my God. He called him my God. In John chapter number 20, I believe it is. What else? My Lord and my God. Jesus raised people from the dead. How many people in the Bible did that? <laughs> it's a real short list. Real short list. And anyone that did other than Christ himself, it was by the power of God. Jesus possesses the attributes of God. This is 10 things that he is found to be in the scriptures. He's eternal. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is unchangeable or immutable. He's holy. He's just. He's loving. He's merciful. He's faithful. Those are all attributes or characteristics of God. They're all found in the Bible, attributes of Jesus Christ himself. The New Testament writers said that Jesus Christ was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And later on it says, and the Word, Jesus, capital W, was made flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, Jesus Christ shed, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he shed God's blood on the cross. That's what it says. In Acts chapter 10, verse 36, it says, and he, Christ, he is the Lord of all. That's what Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says. Do you get it? He's the Lord of all. And then it says in Philippians chapter 2 that he humbled himself under the death of the Christ, but he did not. He was not embarrassed to make himself equal with God. That's what Philippians chapter 2 says about Christ. One more, and I'm done. 
It is his name. And this is probably as near and dear to any of us or all of us as anything that I've said here tonight because we're always, you know, it's kind of like when you see a picture and you're in the picture somewhere in the group, you always look for yourself. How did I look when the picture was taken? There's a team of 30 people, but you're looking for you. Where am I? Oh, look it, I had my eyes closed. We're always looking because we're human beings. We're always looking for this. This is part of our nature. What do I get out of it? What do I get out of it? Yeah, he's all that. Yeah, pastor, he's, I agree. I know that old Bible stuff. I agree with what you said. But what do I get out of it? This is what you get out of it. Neither is there salvation in any other. The name of Jesus Christ. There is no other. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. August the 29th, 1972, building 82 in Kodak Park, room 240 in the Sea Wing, I understood what it meant to be saved. I bowed my head, I bowed my heart, and I confessed my sins to Jesus Christ. And I said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he saved me. And he changed my life. Now, I know that's selfish, but boy, I'm sure glad he did. There's so many good things about him. That's why we scream out in the community. You can tell my beloved, I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. Well, what's so good about him? I'm lovesick. This is what's so good about him. But because of him, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ. He is the reason why we are here, and he is the reason why we will go to Zambia or Kenya or Guatemala or Central America, anywhere Central America, South America, Australia, Wyoming, who would even want to go to New York City? But some people do. They even go to New York City. I think of Mel Sabaka to tell people about Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your greatness, your holiness, and we have good reason to scream out into our community, Lord, we are lovesick for you. We want you. We desire, we desire, we desire you. And that's where it begins with desire. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.